good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on e the EU VAT changes and what e-commerce businesses need to know with uh, Linworks, Avalara, and eBay. Um, today's pre presenters will be Christophe De Jaga from uh, Avalara, the Senior VAT Solutions Manager, Isabel Batawega from uh, eBay, Product Marketing Specialist, and Chris Gates from Product Owner. A product owner from Limwork, sorry. Um, there'll be a presentation for about 30 or 40 minutes and then the opportunity to uh, for a Q&A at the end. There's a box on your console where you can post questions for the presenters and what we'll do is we'll collect them up and then we'll ask the presenters um, to answer them at the end. But right now I'm going to hand over to Christoph at Avalara to, to take us away on the webinar. Thank you and hi everyone. Uh, First of all, also from my side, thank you, thank you for joining this uh, this webinar. So my name is uh, is, is Christoph. I'm working as a solutions uh, manager, VT solutions manager at Avalara. I'm dealing with um, with VT software for for more than 20 years now. My background is VT actually, and um, before Avalara, I've, I've worked as a VT consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, also for a company called VT Applications, uh, and and that company is now acquired by uh, by Avalara since uh, a couple of years. Uh, I'm working from um, our office in Belgium, um, where I live, and so yes, you will notice my my accent, um, and yeah, more than happy to um, to explain you the new e-commerce rules for the EU uh, during this webinar. For those who don't know Avalara, very, very quickly, you know, we are a company that is, uh, that is helping businesses um, with, with their indirect tax uh, compliance. We have cloud-based solutions for tax calculations as well for, as for tax uh, reporting, um, headquartered in Seattle, but um, having 15 offices um, around four continents and our head office for Europe is in, uh, in the UK in Brighton, uh, actually. Um, now, I'm not here to talk about Avalara. Um, um, I'm here today to walk you through the new uh, e-commerce rules and there's a lot uh, of information to share. So let me, let me start uh, immediately. So basically, um, when we're talking about the new e-commerce uh, rules for the EU, there are three areas, right? There are the intra-EU distance selling or the new OS scheme. Um, we have import distance selling and we have the marketplace deemed supplier rules. Okay, so let's start with the um, intra-EU. Uh, sorry, I have to click here. Here we go. So intra-EU distance selling, basically goods that have been shipped from one EU member state to another EU member state. Okay, so what has changed? Before July this year, um, we had distance selling thresholds per country. Okay, so for most countries, this was like uh, 35K, um, but in some countries like in Germany and in the Netherlands, uh, we had uh, 100K. Um, and so if you were not exceeding the threshold in that country, then you still could charge VAT uh, of the country where the supplier is, is established or where the, the goods have been shipped from. Okay, but once you were above the threshold for a certain country, then you had to start charging VET of the customer country. And as a result, you needed um, a VET registration number in that country. Now, since July this year, we have this one stop shop scheme. Okay, so basically, the, the, the EU distance selling thresholds per country have been removed. Okay, so all B2C sales within the EU. And again, we are talking about intra uh, distance selling. So all the sales within the EU will be taxable at destination. Okay, that's quite important. Um, however, you will not need a VT registration number in each country. Now you can all report that in the new OS return. Of course, there are a couple of conditions. So again, goods should be shipped between member states. I will talk in a minute about um, goods that are shipped from a non-EU country to the EU, but this is uh, for um, goods shipped between member states. It's just applicable to B2C transactions. So we are talking about private individual um, buyers. And there is an EU-wide threshold of 10K, but this is just for EU companies. So please bear in mind, if you are a non-EU company, um, it's from the very first sale, okay? Then, in, then this EU-wide threshold is not applicable. And there's one other exception. Uh, if you're holding stock in an, in an EU country or in another EU country than where you are established, then us cannot be applicable. And you still need a full VAT registration number in that country, okay? Um, so as an example, 
Okay, for instance, here you have a UK seller supplying goods from the Netherlands throughout the EU, all B2C. This company is registered in France and in Germany, where it has reached the threshold for distance selling. Okay, so before July, this company was filing VAT returns in the UK, of course, also in the Netherlands, where it has stock, and then in France and Germany, where the thresholds were breached. They charge French VAT to the French customers, German VAT to the German customers, and then Dutch VAT to all other customers because the goods have been shipped from the, from the Netherlands. Okay. Of course, they also had to track uh, the distance selling thresholds for the other member states just to see whether they were about to breach a threshold, but because in that case, they had to register in those countries for, for VAT. Now, since July, what they will have to do is just register for us in the Netherlands, where they have stock. Okay. They will be able to charge local VAT in all EU member states where they have customers B2C. They will file and remit the VAT to the Dutch authorities through us. And then, of course, the Dutch authorities will distribute those funds to the relevant uh, uh, member states. But no thresholds to track anymore. And they can deregister de for VAT uh, in France and in Germany. Okay, so it's quite a simplification. Of course, you have to look at the conditions. And to make things a, a little bit more complex, and I won't go too much into the details here, but we have a union and we have a non-union us return, okay? So for EU established sellers, it's just the union us return, okay? Non-union us return will not be applicable. And this will be in the member state where that seller is established, okay? And by the way, they can also report services in that union us return. Now for non-EU sellers, it's different. You have to make a distinction. Are we talking about B2C services? Then this will have to be reported in the non-union us return, and that could be in the member state of your choice. But for goods, and this is more relevant for today, I guess, if we're talking about B2C transactions goods, then it will be the country where you have stock. Okay, It will be the union us return, even though you're a non-EU established customer as uh, a supplier sorry and it might be that you are required to uh, also um, work with an intermediary in those countries that's really country specific so please in, bear in mind that it might be that you have to to appoint an, an intermediary it's different than with ios for ios there is no choice you will have to okay now um, for import distance selling so for the, the goods that are shipped from a non-EU country to the EU. It's a bit more complex, I have to say. So again, let's start with what have changed. So before July, there was that low value consignment relief with a 22 euros threshold. Okay, so basically consignments that were not exceeding the 22 euros, there was no import um, VT due. Okay, but if the consignment was above 22 euros, then import VT was due. And then you had, of course, look at who is the importer of record. Are you, as a seller, are you um, delivering DAP? So delivered at a place, then, of course, the customer will have to pay the VAT. And that's not really a great experience for the customer. If you are delivering DDP, then yeah, you will have um, to pay import VAT as a seller and then charge domestic VAT of the customer country. As a result, you then need a VAT registration number. So that was before July. Now, what has changed is that we now have the import one-stop shop with a 150 euros threshold, okay? So consignments that are not exceeding the 150 euros threshold, there will be an exemption for import VAT. So there will be no import VAT due if you are registered for IOS, okay? And we come to the, to the conditions later on. But VAT of the, of the customer country will have to be paid on the sale, okay? So it's 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 shift a little bit, and you don't need a VAT registration number in those countries again. This can all be reported in the IOS return. So it's similar to, to us. But consignments above 150, yeah, you know, for those consignments, we would still um, fall back on the normal procedure, meaning import VAT is due. And again, you have to look at who is the importer of record. Okay. Um, again, you know, DAP, it's, it's the most easiest way for sellers, but I guess you will lose a lot of customers. Uh, people are not really expecting that, but okay. Um, just explaining the VT rules here. 
So um, if you look a, a bit closer to what are the conditions for this IOS scheme, of course, uh, again, just B2C. So private individual customers. The goods have been shipped from a non-EU country to an EU country. The value of the consignment should be not exceeding the 150 euros. And very important, this is applicable to EU and non-EU sellers. So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, okay? Treatment is that the place of supply has shifted to where the transportation of the goods ends. So it will be VAT of the country of your customer, but import VAT will be exempt if you're registered for IELTS, of course, okay? And then all non-EU sellers, so UK companies, for instance, they will have to appoint an intermediary in um, that EU member state, okay? Now, um, if you want to use IELTS, what, what should you do? What, what do you need to do, okay? Very quickly, but first of all, okay, you have to register your business on the IELTS portal. Basically, you can choose whenever, whatever a member state you want, um, eventually through an intermediary if you're a non-EU company, but the, the European Commission has said that they prefer that you would do that in the member state where you do have um, performed the uh, importation, okay? But it's not mandatory, okay? Um, Avalara can help you either way to register for, for IELTS if you want. Um, then you will have to provide your IELTS number to the person declaring the goods at the border. Um, you will have to display the uh, VAT amount to be paid by the buyer. And that's at, at the latest when the uh, order process is finalized. Uh, make sure that the goods are shipped in consignments not exceeding those um, that, that threshold, of course, because otherwise it will not be applicable. You will have to produce an invoice uh, showing the price, but also um, with your IOS number. And then you submit month monthly IOS return. So IOS return is quarterly, an IOS return is a monthly return, okay? Also monthly payments, and then you will have to keep records for, um, for all your IELTS sales for over 10 years, okay? I will talk about the marketplace um, deemed supplier in a minute, but basically if the online marketplace is the deemed supplier, then they will have to provide the sellers with their IELTS number, produce an invoice, and that invoice can then be used with that IELTS number of the marketplace um, to provide to the carrier to ship the goods. No? That's quite quite important as well, I think. Um, now, oh, sorry for that, my fault. So a couple of considerations in terms of, of IELTS. Um, goods may not be subject to excise duties. So IELTS can never be used for alcohol or for instance for uh, tobacco products. So quite important. Um, I would say even more important is that the threshold of 150 euros, that applies to the whole consignment. So please bear that in mind. As an example here, if you have two items or even you know two, two invoices, one invoice for 100 euro, um, one other invoice for 60 euros, that makes that the total value of the consignment is 160. So that is above the threshold. Okay, very important. The other thing I would like to point out here is that IOS is not mandatory. Okay, so it's a simplified process. It allows you to ship goods from non-EU member states, uh, non-EU countries, to the 27 EU member states with one single registration. So that's great. But if you want, you can still continue using the DAP or DDP model. Um, but of course, if you choose to use IOS, then all transactions must be reported on their IELTS. So there's, there's no pick and mix. It's one thing or the other, okay? And then finally, yes, you can reclaim uh, VET on, on return goods, um, but it's, it's, you know, the method is it's slightly different on the country because it's, it's not like there is one OS return or I OS return. Uh, no, each member state has, has created its own um, OS and I OS return. So it's a little bit uh, different depending on the country. And then, um, my last area here uh, to cover is the um, EU marketplace facilitator rules or the online um, um, marketplace deemed supplier rules. Okay. So basically an online marketplace must understand two things that are important, I guess. So first, when is a marketplace facilitating a sale? And the other um, important thing is, um, okay, what transactions are in scope? Now let's start with uh, when is a marketplace facilitating a sale? It's slightly different in the EU than, than in, in Europe. In Europe, we say that um, an electronic interface, that's, that's what we call it, but so basically an online marketplace is facilitating a sale 
if the platform has control of the on the general terms and conditions or um, it is involved in authorizing the charge to the customer in terms of the payment or it participates in the ordering or delivery of the goods so at least one of those three things should be should be covered okay and the marketplace will not be considering uh, will not be uh, considered to facilitate the sale um, if it's just uh, providing one of the following services just payment processing like paypal for instance or just advertising or redirecting customers to other marketplaces without any further involvement in that case the marketplace will not be considered to be facilitating the sale okay now what transactions are in scope we have to make a huge very important um, difference okay again are the goods within the eu or are the goods imported from outside the eu when the goods are within the eu it doesn't matter this is um, applicable to all goods of any value okay but it's only for non-eu sellers so that's quite important and again just for b2c transactions when the goods are imported from outside the eu then the consignment may not exceed the 150 threshold okay but in that case, if the goods are imported from outside the EU, it's applicable to EU and non-EU sellers. So it's a bit more complex. Um, that's why I have created this kind of checklist and, and you will also um, be able to download this. So basically the first question you have to raise yourself is, okay, ask yourself is, okay, are the goods dispatched from outside the EU? On the top, if the answer is no, second question should be, are the goods sold by a non-EU seller? Only if the answer is yes, the marketplace can be the deemed supplier. On the other hand, if the goods are uh, not, uh, if the goods are shipped from outside the EU, then the second question is: Are the goods um, uh, exceeding the 150 threshold? If the answer is no, then the electronic interface or the marketplace can be the deemed supplier. Okay. Um, this is basically, and then I'm um, almost there. Um, this is basically the treatment then. Okay, so one transaction will be split into two supplies, one deemed supply from the seller to the marketplace, and that will be zero rated without VAT, and then one sale from the marketplace to the customer with domestic VAT of the country of the customer. Okay, um, so before I hand over to Isabel, just a couple of um, takeaways that I would like to give you. Um, first of all, ask yourself the right questions, right? Um, are we talking about intra-EU distance selling? Then us could be applicable. Are we talking about import distance selling? Then IOS could be applicable. Is an online marketplace involved? Then you should know who is the, the supplier or the deemed supplier. Okay. Please bear in mind always those new rules are applicable only for B2C transactions. Okay. And then of course make sure that you uh, charge the right VAT rate of the 27 EU member states. So you might need a tax engine. Avalara can also help you with that if you want. And much more details on on these new rules. You can find that on um, our VetLife website. You have the link here. Um, so there's much more than 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 what I've told you here. But I I think I summarized uh, what is important for you guys. So I'm going to hand over to Isabel now. If there are any questions, we have the Q&A um, later on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the for the handover. Um, I'm happy to take over here. Um, my name is Isabel. I'm now with eBay since about two and a half years. Um, I'm part of the global product marketing team and responsible for the go to market uh, strategies for uh, EU vet changes. Um, so in the yeah, basically this year I didn't do anything else besides um, yeah getting myself into this um, lovely topic and I'm happy to walk you today through the changes on our eBay platform that you should consider to comply with the changes on the 1st of July. Um, so I separated the changes um, that should be taken into three buckets and the first one um, as already said is um, the iOS number. So eBay also has its own iOS number and it's an individual number that is the same one for all eBay marketplaces. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're registered on eBay UK or eBay.de. Um, it's always the same um, iOS number that needs to be shared with transactions where eBay has collected VAT. Um, and this number is also always the same for each transaction. So it's just this one single number. 
The second bucket is VAT rates, um, and we already heard um, how important VAT rates are. So if you are VAT registered, you should always provide VAT rates to your European and UK listings when you list on eBay. Um, if you're not VAT registered, um, you don't need to provide the VAT rates, um, but you should um, yeah, you should be aware that there might be changes to your um, prices at the end when we are obliged to collect VAT. And the third bucket is the business details. So when you're as a when you are registered as a business on eBay, you should make sure that always your business details are accurate. Um, and this includes your VAT ID, your address, your item location, uh, as well as the OS registration in case it applies. So coming now in more detail to the VAT rates. Um, so whenever you provide gross price, you should provide the um, VAT rates you use to calculate this gross price. Um, and this again accounts for sellers who are VAT registered. When we are as eBay are obliged to collect VAT, we will compute in the back end the net price based on the values that you provided. Um, and then um, at the VAT amount that we need to collect on top. And I know this sounds quite complicated, so I will try to make this as an example. For example, if you list with 120 euros and 20% VAT rate, and you're trading uh, to Germany, where usually 19% apply, we would compute in the back end the net amount, which would be in my example, 100 euros, and at the 19% on top. So we would show your price as 119 across all our placements. And this includes already um, the search page. So when a buyer is searching for an item on eBay.de, in my example, um, as well as the item page, um, and then again on the checkout. When you don't provide a VAT rate, um, you should be aware that we will add the VAT amount on top. So if you don't, if you list with 120 euros and don't provide a VAT rate, we would add the 19% of my example on top of the price. And um, yeah, I'm saying this because as you could imagine, this might destroy your conversion um, as your prices might become uncompetitive because obviously the price increases. Um, so it's really essential that VAT rates will be added wherever a seller is VAT registered. Coming up to the example or the use case um, when we are not obliged to collect VAT, and this is usually the case for imports uh, from UK to Europe um, above 150 euros. So in these cases, um, as we already learned in the Avalara section before, um, there's still uh, import VAT that might apply. So in these cases, we are showing net prices to the buyers. And we're doing this because it's definitely more competitively priced um, and we want to avoid that our buyers are paying somehow double VAT because they would one uh, pay VAT on the checkout and then again deliver pay VAT on delivery um, if if you're not using DDP solutions. So what we're doing is basically the same logic. Um, if you provide a gross price and a VAT rate, we would still compute the net price, but we are also showing the net price already on search um, as well as uh, on the view item page and again on checkout. So the buyer would pay the net price and then when the item um, is being delivered, uh, they would pay the import VAT in this example. Um, and just that you are aware, if you don't provide a VAT rate in this example, we would, we would show the just provided price. Um, and um, again, as I said, it might be the case that buyers then pay double VAT. So how can most easily um, VAT rates can be added in the in bulk um, with eBay? So we have in our seller hub, if you're familiar with it, um, the listings tab. And on this listing tab, um, you might have realized in the past weeks that we are showing you a small flag uh, that is highlighted here in green, which shows missing VAT rates. And um, these are all your listings um, that don't include a VAT rate. And you can easily uh, click on on this download button and then you get a list, um, an Excel file with all your listings where a VAT rate is missing. And in this Excel file, you can then just add the VAT rates, um, for example, just add 20% to all your listings and then you can 
yeah, here you can download it and here you can then click on upload and you can upload the same file where you edit the vet rates you can upload it and then all your listings include a vet rate so this is a task that might take a few minutes um, but it saves you conversion and will ensure that your listings remain competitive Coming now to where it can be identified the transactions, um, uh, where you can identify transactions where eBay has collected VAT. So there are three buckets. The first one is the order details. And I brought you a, a screenshot here. So in this um, order details, you can read at the bottom uh, VAT paid um, as well as our iOS number. Um, this would be the first option. It's quite manual, but you can also use the second option, which is uh, the orders download report. And uh, the orders download report has two entry points. The first one is uh, in Seller Hub reports tab. Uh, and the second option uh, would be in the orders tab in Seller Hub, or you can also access it uh, via APIs. And in this orders report, um, you will find several fields that show you details about transactions where eBay collected VAT. Um, you can also find, for example, the amount that has been collected from eBay. Um, the third option is via our APIs. Um, I already said the orders report is available through APIs, um, but you can also find this information um, in all our other APIs. So we provided uh, a detailed communication uh, through developers. Um, and um, yeah, it's basically everywhere where you find information for transactions. You can also find if eBay collected VAT. So we already spoke about iOS number and um, for our transactions, um, as you know, where eBay collected VAT, eBay's iOS number should be shared electronically to carriers. And there are several options how this could be done. So the first option is carrier operations. So we highly recommend you um, to reach out to carriers to understand what exactly is required from their end and how they need eBay's iOS number. You already learned how you can find, identify transactions and you also need to um, yeah, understand how carriers need to use this information. The second option is uh, third-party listings tools. Um, and it's quite similar here. You, so please reach out to your listing tool um, and they um, yeah, will tell you um, how they will share iOS, eBay's iOS number or what needs to be done on your end. The third option um, is the if you use eBay's shipping label platform, you don't have to do anything because it will be shared already um, electronically. Um, and automatically in the back end. So whenever you're using eBay's shipping label platform, you don't have to worry about eBay's iOS S number. We are taking care of everything. And the same applies to eBay's global shipping program. So if you're using eBay, eBay's global shipping program for your uh, European imports, you don't have to worry about eBay's iOS S number. Um, it's quite similar to all the other custom documentation that we are taking over from you. And the fifth bucket is quite manual, but it's also possible. Um, so you, you learned where you find eBay's iOS S number and you know that it's always the same. So um, you can also manual apply this number to transactions where it's needed. Um, but please make sure if you use a manual uh, process that you show it only for the transactions where it's needed. And this is again only for transactions uh, for European imports with a value up to 150 euros. And also, please make sure that you only share it for eBay transactions. When you uh, when you trade uh, via other marketplaces, they have separate um, numbers, and you should not mix them. So it's already um, also explained by Avalaro when we are obliged to collect and remit and collecting. Um, VAT, we also have to issue invoices to buyers. And the important key takeaway why I also included it here is please don't issue a separate tax invoice in these cases um, because they already get it from us. And the last point um, I before I uh, do a quick summary, um, please keep your um, eBay account details updated. Um, you can go on eBay UK slash SPR slash VAT, and I know the, the color is not well chosen here. Um, you can also find this uh, link on our help pages, but please add your VAT number uh, here, um, your VAT ID, if you are VAT registered, um, and also make sure that all the other business details are accurate, including your um, address as well as um, your item location. And this ensures that we can always um, yeah, ensure that we do the co correct 
text calculation, I, I phrase it this way, um, in the back end. So to summarize, uh, there are three things uh, that you should consider. Uh, the first one is adding bed rates. And um, I hope you understood how important it is to remain competitively priced, um, that bed rates um, will be included in all European and UK sites. The second one, uh, get in contact with your carrier if you haven't already, um, how they are requiring eBay's IOSS number. Um, and yeah, ensure that um, all the carrier processes um, are up to date. Um, if you think you can't comply with this um, in a very short time frame, we are recommending you to use um, eBay's global shipping program in the time in between because everything will be handled automatically uh, and it could be a, a good solution for until you have been fully prepared your business. And the last one is, um, yeah, as I said, check your details in your eBay account and make sure that everything um, is accurate and still up to date. And with this, I'm happy to hand over to Chris from Lenworks. OK, thank you very much as well. OK, so um, I'm Chris, and I'm going to be covering how Limworks um, works with these IOSS numbers. So what we've learned so far um, from our previous speakers is that uh, marketplaces are the ones that have these IOSS numbers for, as we've already seen, orders that are under 150 euros coming in from a third country. So in this example, it's going to be um, that the marketplace is the one that has this IOSS number, and it is the carriers that will eventually need this IOSS number or the ISOS number. And Limworks is essentially a platform that sits in the middle of these two. Oops, sorry. Uh, slides aren't working. Um, so some marketplaces do provide Limworks with an IOSS number. So as you see, eBay, Amazon, Frugo, they would all um, uh, give the IOS number to Limworks when Limworks captures orders, um, which means Limworks is going to store these IOS numbers against your orders. So if we look at exactly how that looks inside Limworks, you can see that we actually store that IOS number on the order as an extended property. So it'll be called marketplace underscore IOSS. We store that number against the order, which means for um, for orders for those marketplaces, there's nothing manual you need to set up. There's nothing. There's no configuration that needs to take place there. Limworks is capturing those orders and it's taking that IOSS number and it's saving it to the order. Okay, but not all um, marketplaces will send Limworks an IOSS number, so you may need to add it to your your orders um, automatically. Now, you're not going to have time to add all these numbers manually to your orders. Doing so would lead to, to human error as well. We'd instead use the rules engine to help automate this process. So for, for Limworks sellers, you can see that the, the rules engine essentially works on conditions and actions. So in Limworks, you can set up a rule that basically checks for all of these conditions that Christoph and Isabel already mentioned. So is the order from a specific marketplace in this example, see discount? Is it going to the EU from my um, outside third country, being the UK? And is it under 150 euros? Once we check all of those things, then the condition we would add to there is add the right condition, um, add the right uh, IOSS number. So let's see what that rule actually looks like. So it's a fairly simple rule, as you can see there. That's how it would look inside Limworks. And if we break that down, this section here that says IOSS required, we're actually adding that straight into this rule. So we're saying the source is C discount, the subtotal is 100, uh, less than or equal to 150, and the shipping country is one of the um, EU member states. Now, the reason you would want to set this up with a rule is obviously it, it's completely automatic. Once you set it up, it will, it will add these IOS numbers in for you. Um, but also it gives you control to make changes to this as and when you need to. Um, so if you want to slightly tweak some values, if you want to change the source country, things like that, you're in control of that because you've used the Limworks rules engine to, to, to add this automation yourself. And this isn't something like a, a macro or a script that you have to know how to code to make any of this work. This all happens completely visually inside Limworks. Um, so how does Limworks send the IOSS number to the carrier? Now, every carrier is different. They all call IOSS something different as well. So uh, in Limworks, we call it the marketplace IOSS. 
but the carriers can call them completely different things. The IOSS registration number, the tax ID, the sender EOAR number, they can all be very different. But you can use Linworks to essentially map that one field to, um, to the correct carrier, to the field that they expect. So how do we map our extended properties to the right fields? There's actually a screen in Linworks for that as well. So you'd open up the configuration screen <coughs> inside your config in Linworks. And as you can see there, uh, this config is, is saying this is where we need to place our marketplace IOSS, and you just type that in there. Now, what we have is we have guides on, on all of this and a guide that breaks down every single courier you could be using and every service on that courier to tell you exactly what that courier is expecting and where to, to map that IOSS number. So what you'll be able to do is uh, follow those guides, set up that rules engine, and also set up these uh, mappings as well. And then everything will be good to go. It will all be happening automatically, seamlessly in the back end. Um, and the ISS numbers will be captured from the marketplace, saved against your orders so you can look them up if you need to. And then they'll be sent over to the, um, to the correct courier in the way that they expect. And what we'll do is we'll take uh, links to both of those guides and we'll send them out after the, after the webinar um, to, to all the most users so that you've got uh, access to go and create those rules yourself. Um, okay, so that was just a, a quick one from me on how to set all this up in Limworks. Um, I think we're going to move on to the Q&A now, Nadia. Yes, thanks a lot, Chris. Um, so there's a few questions waiting, so I will sort of work through them and read them out, and um, the few of them are directed at individuals, otherwise um, I'll sort of uh, direct them to different people. So uh, not sure who this one is for. Um, so from Daniel, we have added all the correct VAT rates applicable to each EU country on our account. Therefore, does that mean you won't automatically take 20% off before your calculation of the correct VAT percent? I'm not sure if that one's directed to eBay. Isabel? Yes, I, I think so. Um, yeah, so maybe let me explain how this works. So if you have the correct VAT rate already in your listing, you wouldn't recognize any changes. Um, you can imagine our um, that we whenever we are computing a net price in the backend, um, I, I imagine myself it's more like a VAT uh, validation. So if you already provide the correct um, that rate you shouldn't realize any change but you should be aware when we are obliged to collect VAT that you just get the net amount because we already took care of that if you say so I hope this answers the question um, thanks Isabel and I think another one from Daniel which I think is probably for you uh, will there be a report or a breakdown available of VAT collected on our account so if you mean a report of all the just a calculation or a summary of all the transactions where eBay collected. Um, this is not available. Um, by now, you have a report available of all the orders, uh, which goes back to 90 days. And there you can see then on which transaction we have collected or not. Uh, great, thanks. Um, uh, yeah, one one more for eBay. Um, we are informed by eBay that sales over 150 pounds uh, eBay are not charging the customer VAT, so we must ship the item DDU. The courier will then request the VAT and duties from the customer before delivery. Is the customer aware some couriers will charge them an admin fee for doing this? As we expect, most customers will decline the package and request return to sender and a refund. If they have to pay more than expected, uh, they will then have to cover the return to sender charge. Yeah, so I think this is more a general awareness question. Um, I think it's not really related to eBay. I mean, every marketplace um, or every import into UK has this problem, or also every export from the UK to Europe has this problem that the um, import VAT will be due. Um, but if you are shipping the item uh, DDU, you should the buyer should not pay again VAT, if my understanding there is correct. Um, great. Um, and this one's a bit more of a general question. Uh, how long does it take to get an IOSS number? I can take that one. Um, yeah, thanks, Christoph. So an IOS number, I would say not, not more than three days. It's, it's very quick. Um, for an US number, um, that's a bit country depending. And as an average, I would say three to two to three weeks for an, for an us number but for an ios number just three days 
Great. Thank you, Christoph. Um, another question from Mark for uh, Isabel. Um, if we send a price to eBay, including UK tax, if bought in the EU, exam, for example, Germany, do you remove the UK tax value and apply the German tax rate as the selling price? Uh, yes, exactly. So this is um, basically the example that I, that I shared. So when you provide um, an item value of 120, including 20% UK VAT shipping to Germany, we would adjust the price, um, let's say, uh, to 119 in this example. Great. Um, and a quick question from Lee. What is DAP and DDP? I think some acron acronyms there. Yeah, probably because I use those terms. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, DAP is, you know, just delivered at place, meaning, you know, you just take care of the seller for the transportation of the goods and that's it. So, uh, custom duties or import VAT and so on is all on the customer side. That's DAP. While DDP is um, delivery duty paid. So, all um, duties and, and import VAT is um, dealt with. Uh, of by the uh, by the seller so the customer don't have to pay any additional costs uh, at the delivery great um and this one is also um i think quite probably a general question um from laura could i request confirmation that ios must be applied to all your b2c good sales if you register for it um, they registered for IOS through Deloitte and they advise us that after you receive an IOS number, you can still send parcels such that the customer pays for VAT at the point of import. Yeah, I saw that, that question in the, in the chat box as well and a quite interesting question, I have to say. Um, yeah, as far as I know, you have to choose. Um, it's one thing or the other and I guess you can you can uh, change to another um, delivery term after two years. So, so you have to wait for two years. But let me, you know, I'm quite sure, but let me also um, have a look at where I found that, which, where, in which legislation or which uh, explanatory work notes from the EU Commission, and then uh, we can provide that to uh, the person who asked that question. Great, thanks a lot. We can we can um, share this afterwards. Um, from Sonali uh, for Isabel, how do these changes affect the eBay Global Shipping program, program? Is there any change or impact at all? Yeah, so it's so the changes. Um, so um, okay, let me phrase it this way: um, If you you don't have to provide eBay's IOSS number because we are taking care of it already. So at this stage, there's no change. But you should still make sure that your listings are including VAT rates if you are a VAT registered, um, because there the same logic applies. But besides that, you don't have to take care of eBay's I uh, IOSS number. Great, thanks. Um, from Mark, um, what about children's clothing in the UK with zero VAT? Uh, I assume in the EU you were going to remove the UK VAT, which isn't there, and adding EU-specific VAT. How will this work as the net price will be low? Uh, yeah, so in this case, um, it's the zero percentage would then yeah, somehow work as the gross price is the net amount. So we would basically in this example, increase the price and add the 19% on top so that we can collect the appropriate amount. Um, great, sort of questions coming thick and fast. Um, uh, one from Edward, um, we are a business based in the UK on B2B purchases that are sold on eBay EU websites that are not covered by IOS do we need to send orders with a delivery duty paid service or will eBay communicate to B2B customers that there will be an import duty charge on the purchase when it's delivered? I'm not sure if I fully understood the question, honestly. Um, it's, yeah, it seems to be about B2B purchases sold on eBay that are not covered by IOS. Yeah, so we is are. There import, so our is systems, there an import duty? Um, I I leave the import duty question to Mark, but um, but um, we are able to identify if there's a B two B transaction. So we see that if a customer has a VAT ID, for example, so we are able to identify these transactions. Um, but I'm not sure about the IOSS part. Maybe Avalara can explain there a little bit more how B two B is impacted. 
And just to be sure, we are talking about imports from the UK to the EU? Uh, yes, looks like yeah. business based in the, yeah. E yeah. E on, in okay. the UK so, that's so, sold on EU websites. Yeah, so if you know if the goods are shipped from from the UK to the EU, um, and we are talking about B two B transactions, so what what's the difference basically that you receive a VAT registration number from your customer? Well, in that case, IOS will will never be applicable, and then you have to look at what are the delivery terms. Again, if it's DDP, so the seller is taking care of the import duties and 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 uh, and import VAT, then then yeah, then they should register in that country and that's the only way and then charge local VET or in some countries it could be reverse charge. That's really depending on the country. Uh, I guess in the UK, if it was the other way around, um, if your customer would have a UK VAT registration number, then it could be reverse charge. Then the seller would not have to register for, for VET in the UK. But um, yeah, it's really country depending, but uh, yeah, you cannot use IOS. So, it's depending whether you want to take care of the import duties or not, or if you want to to, to tell your customer, "Hey, guy, this this is uh, this is on you," um, even if it's B two B. Um, thanks. And another, maybe another add, there's question. No, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, I just wanted to add. Uh, there's no additional communication in these cases uh, from the eBay side. I think this was also part of the question. So we are not uh, sharing any additional communication in these cases. Oh, thanks, Isabel. Um, another question for Christoph. Um, am I from Hakan? Uh, am I correct that as a UK business, if our turnover is over ten thousand euros to the EU, we have to register for VAT in one of the EU countries? Ninety percent of our sales are on eBay, and if we have to register for VAT in an EU country, can we only file VAT returns for transactions exceeding one hundred and fifty euros? As eBay collects VAT for transactions under one hundred and fifty euros. No. So so. This is what you have to bear in mind. If you are using IOS, then only your B2C transactions for which IOS is applicable, meaning shipments below 100 are not exceeding 150 euros. The VAT amounts for those countries can be added to the, um, to the IOS return, nothing else. So if you do have, for instance, if you do have stock in an EU country and you have a, a, a full VAT registration number in that country, that means that if you have customers in that country where you do have a warehouse or stock, that you will have to charge local VAT, but this cannot be included in your IOS return, that this will be included in your normal VAT return for that country. But but other than that, you know, it's it's you always have to look, is us or IOS applicable or not? If it's applicable because it's not exceeding the 150 in case of IOS, then it can be included in the IOS return, but nothing else than that. I hope that's that's an answer to the question. Thanks, Christoph. Um, a more general question: Are shipments from Northern Ireland being treated uh, as EU to EU? Yeah, that's an interesting one, right? So, so it's a bit a. Uh, it's a, it's a complex situation now uh, with Northern Ireland, but basically when it comes to goods, not services, but when it comes to goods, Northern Ireland is treated as an EU member state. Well, it is not an EU member state, but it's treated as an EU member state. That means that if you're shipping goods uh, from Northern Ireland to France, for instance, that yes, uh, IOS can be uh, applicable, can be used. But the same company shipping goods from London to France, those transactions cannot be uh, included in the IOS return. Great, thanks. Yes, and um, uh, adding here um, from the eBay side. Well, um, so, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, well, yeah, I'm, just maybe from the I eBay was... side. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> no, just, um, so we are aware of this complexity. Uh, and we are trying to um, identify these transactions uh, via postal codes. Um, but as Christopher said, there is a, definitely a complexity. But we are yeah, yeah, I was maybe trying to identify this transaction. Yeah, I, I was maybe not, not that clear. But so from Northern Ireland to France, for instance, would be us return would not be IOS because it would be treated as an as an EU country. And then from London to France would be IOS, right? Because then it would be treated as, as an importation. So that, that's basically what I wanted to say. Uh, thank you. Um, another question from Taz. Um, I am a UK seller on eBay and sell in EU only via eBay GSP program. Do I have to do anything on my side and will it affect me? And also, do I still have to update VAT rates on all listings? 
So I think in general, this is a question that uh, should be discussed with a um, tax consultant. It's also based on the individual situation of sellers. Uh, so I'm not sure if the seller is VAT registered um, or not. Um, but it's so in general, it's recommended by us to always include a VAT rate um, if you're VAT registered on the UK side as well as for U uh, European shipments. Um, but besides that, um, yeah, great that you're using global shipping program, but you don't have to consider anything else. Um, thanks, Isabel. Another another question for you. Um, does VAT rates apply to kids' items such as clothing going from the UK to the EU? I think I had a similar question earlier. Um, yeah, so also here, um, our systems will recognize if this category, for example, requires 5% um, in France or 19% in Germany. And uh, based on what you've added um, to the listing, so if you added 20%, we would um, compute the net price. Um, based on the values that you provided and at the um, VAT rate that we need um, on top of it. So if you provide yeah, zero so, percentage, so, that means we just add it on top. So bottom line, you know, you have to look at the VAT rate of the country where your customer is located and not any longer to the UK legislation, right? Yeah, so there, uh, yeah, it depends on the country and the category. Wow. Well. Thank you. Um, I think this is a similar question. Uh, could you please explain the case where the merchant is in an EU member state, the stock is located in another EU member state, and the goods are sent to a different member state's customers? Um, can we play this with under and over 150 euro values? So if you're shipping goods from one member state to another one, and um, then we're talking about intra-EU. For intra-EU, we don't have to look at the, at the value of the goods, right? Um, if you have a stock in France and in Belgium, and you're shipping goods to all EU member states from those two warehouses, then you know it will be the VAT rate of where your customer is, is, is established, except for your Belgian and your uh, French uh, customers, because you do have a full VAT registration number in the country where you do have stock, and those that those VAT amounts of that local um, um, sale in, in, in those two countries will be included in the normal VAT return, not in the OS return. But but for the other transactions, yes, everything will be will be included in your OS return. And you can choose one of those two member states to register for us. Great. In um, our system, we'll from... also recognize it. So that is why, sorry to add and jump in here as well, but uh, this is yeah, why it's so ahead. important that the business details are always accurate so that we also know where is the seller registered and uh, where is the items located so that we know um, we can identify the transactions where we need to collect VAT. Ah, great. Um, another question um, from Taz for, for Chris. Um, so I think might be a Linux customer. We are already an Avalara client via Amazon. Do we need to do anything related to iOS or OSS or these new changes? Well, honestly, I cannot answer that question, but um, maybe Chris can. Uh, for for yeah. I would say from from an Avalara standpoint, please talk to your uh, Amazon accountant uh, account manager. <laughs> um, they will tell you because you know we basically Amazon is is one of our customers. And, and we do work for their customers, but please, please talk to your Amazon uh, account manager. Chris, did you have any feedback on that? Um, yeah, so uh, do we have anything related to IOSS um, or OSS, these new changes? If it's Amazon, um, then we would automatically pick up that IOSS number uh, from uh, orders that are under the correct threshold and going to the right um, uh, country. So that will automatically be added to the order. So you'll see your orders already have the IOSS number attached to them. But depending on the courier, you might have to um, tweak some courier settings to make sure that Limworks is sending the IOS number to the right um, courier field. So uh, we'll have a look at that guide. It will tell you the ones the majority of them happen automatically. Anyway, there are only a few that you might have to tweak some settings. Um, but we'll send those guides out and you'll be able to see. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, question from David. Um, when exporting a consignment to an EU warehouse, say an FBA warehouse in France, with a stock value of under 150 euros, but a retail value of over 150 euros, do you need to submit an IOS number on the commercial invoice in addition to an EU EORI number? Yeah, it's, it's the value of the shipment, right? So, so it's what you sell and what you have it's the, the, the price that you ask your customer to pay you. Right, it's quite straightforward. <laughs> um, and from Edward, yeah. if we register for v <laughs> if we register for VAT in an EU country and we send a B two B order that is not covered by IOS, can we pay the VAT for the sale through an EU VAT return so the customer will not be charged VAT at the time of import? Yeah, I'm not sure if I. If I get this question right, so we are talking about B2B. Um, yes. What, could you maybe repeat the question? That would be maybe the best thing. Yeah. Yeah. If we register for VAT in an EU country and we send a B2B order that is not covered by IOS, can we pay the VAT for the sale through an EU VAT return so the customer would not be charged VAT at the time of import? Yeah. So if, if we're talking about B2B, us or IOS can never be, never be applicable. Okay, then we have to look at the at the local legislation. It could be reverse charge. It could be with VAT. That's really depending on the national um, legislation in that country. So country depending, really. Thank you. Um, from Kate, will um, London to Northern Ireland sales need an IOS? I guess England to, to Northern Ireland sales has, would that need an IOS? Yeah, that's a very good question. As far as I know, <clears throat> those uh, transactions would be treated as a domestic UK uh, supply, so would not not would not require uh, IELTS. Great. Um, and from Sophia, um, a general question. Um, from my understanding, before July, samples under 22 euros were not subject to duties if shipping from UK to an EU country. Um, if I was to ship an item deemed as a sample that is under 22 euros from UK to an EU country now, does the receiver need to pay duties? So I'm not, not sure if samples count as how they count as goods, whether that makes a difference. Sorry. Was that the question to Isabel? Uh, I, think, well, I think it's more a general question. question. Yeah. Ah, yeah. sorry. I, I thought it, maybe it wasn't Isabel who's asking the question. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I was not really listening to the question. Um, oh, sorry, fault. I can read it again. Um, um, for, yeah, um, before before the, the changes, uh, samples under 20 euros were not subject to duties if shipping from the UK to an EU country. Uh, if I was to ship an item deemed as a sample, that is under 22 euros from the UK to the EU now, does the receiver need to pay duties? Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I I don't think so because you're not selling anything, right? And distance, distance selling is really about selling goods. So samples, I guess, would not be, would not fall under this. Hmm. Thanks. Um, and I think yes, but when we speak about general for... goods, Sorry, but when we speak about general goods, so not just saying samples, um, when we say, uh, yeah, samples are general goods, um, yes, yeah, this 22 euro threshold just fall away. It doesn't exist in this case. Great. Um, and yeah, one it more question for Isabel. Anymore, um, right? um, do we need to, for, for Israel, do we need to register an EU VAT number to sell items via, via the global shipping program from miles? Uh, so it's it's not a thing um, about EU VAT number. Um, so it's not really related to the global shipping program. If you as a business uh, need to register in any other European countries, um, that's independently from the global shipping program. But you, it's not a, you don't have to do it to be part of the global shipping program. Let's phrase it in this way. Great. 
Um, I think we've just come to the end of our question just about, and the, the webcast itself is going to end very shortly. So thank you very much to our three presenters today. Um, the slides are available in the console as a PDF. This webinar will also be available on demand immediately at the end of the webinar um, via the same link. So if you want to watch back again or you want to share it with colleagues, um, the link uh, is, um, is live for you to watch back um, in your own time. So um, thanks for attending this afternoon and thank you very much to our three presenters and we hope to see you on the next LinWorks webinar. Um, so have a good afternoon. <laughs>